Hey everybody, welcome to the show. On today's program, I'll be reviewing the 11th studio album by Pink Floyd, titled The Wall on Columbia Records from 1979. While it received mixed reviews on its release, it produced their only number one hit single and has gone on to be their second most successful album just behind Dark Side. It's a record I've known about almost my entire life, but it's only now that I'm looking at it with critical eyes. So join me as we dive into The Wall. Now before we get started, it's important for you to understand that this is a rock opera, meaning that the entire album is about the character of Pink. He's based largely on Roger Waters and to some extent Pink Floyd's original leader Sid Barrett. Story-wise, the record starts with Pink as a child, then we follow him becoming a rock star and then seeing the ugly side of fame and fortune. During all of this, Pink is building a wall around himself to protect his emotions. The climax of the story is him understanding that you can't hide behind this wall. You have to tear it down in order to be loved. <music> Opening up the album we have In the Flesh, and I don't know if this was just me, but oh my gosh, I put the needle on and the song starts off very, very quiet. I'm thinking, oh, I, I must have something wrong. So I turn up the stereo and that's when I'm blasted with this sound. I have to assume Roger did this on purpose to have people do this. It really wakes you up, preparing you for this odyssey of a record. Then the song really starts and it's very boisterous. It feels militaristic with sharp drum hits, but then this lovely melody is being played by the Hammond organ and the guitar, and it just gives this overall warm feeling with just a hint of the blues. Then all that drops away when the lyrics come in and the quiet thumping here is very reminiscent of a heartbeat. This to me represents the womb or, or maybe it's supposed to be a quiet moment of reflection like Pink as an adult thinking back to his very first memories. To feel the song concludes with the sound of an airplane crashing or perhaps even dive bombing, and this represents the father of Pink dying in World War II. The crying baby here represents the birth of Pink or him as a newborn child crying out for his father. This also signals the start of track two, The Thin Ice. And here we have our first taste of the brilliant use of two vocalists. Throughout this album, Roger and David trade singing lead vocals, and when they do, it's always very deliberate, playing off each other's strengths. For David's part of this song, he's singing a very sweet lullaby of sorts that's very loving, and it's in the voice of Pink's mother. When Roger comes in, the song takes on a more doo-wop feel that does a great job of belying the dark lyrics. And then Roger's harsher vocal style helps to underscore the idea that danger is everywhere. In the narrative of the album, the thin eyes represents Pink as a young child learning that the outside world is a dangerous place despite how it looks. We then move right into Another Brick in the Wall, part one. Lyrically, this song is expressing Pink losing the father he never knew. This creates an emotion that he doesn't want to feel, and here is where he gets his first brick. The light guitar solo section is sort of the calm before the storm as we hear children playing in the background. It's quiet, almost like a faint memory. For me, it represents that blissful time before you're old enough to go off to school, when you don't have a care in the world and you just are having fun playing. Uh -huh. 
This fades out as a helicopter approaches, signaling the arrival of track four, the happiest day of our lives. For me, the title of this song is sarcastic to say the least, as this section is all about how children are mistreated by strict school teachers. Roger based this largely on his own childhood, and I think he's trying to say that this is supposed to be a happy time, and yet Pink is accosted by this mean teacher, and looking back as an adult, that wasn't okay. Then we quickly transition into track five, Another Brick in the Wall, part two. This was Pink Floyd's biggest hit, their only number one hit single, and it's the song I most associate with this album. In fact, I heard this song long before I ever knew what the wall was, and to me, I can't imagine my life without it. It's actually really difficult to express the impact that this song has had on me. I mean, this is dystopia, it is haunting, it is depressing, and it's poignant. And the guitar solo is so refined here. The crunchiness of the tone, the wailing, it's all so expressive, but played so minimally by David Gilmour. What's amazing is that this was done in one take. And Richard Wright's keyboards really help to support the music. He lends this brilliant, fragility to the whole sequence. All the while, the bass and drums are just driving the song forward in a disco beat. The song ends in a chaotic tape loop of a teacher yelling, and we find Pink rebelling against conformity. Because of this experience, his education has become more bricks in his wall. Overall, this is fantastic track placement. The way Another Brick in the Wall Part 2 ends, there's this nice break, a breath, before we close side one with the somber mother. Now, I see this song as two separate sections. In the first, Pink is expressing insecurities about life and questioning fear, ambition, and trust. When the mom comes in to answer him, sung by David Gilmour, it's rather subversive. Mama's gonna make all of your nightmares come true. Mama's gonna I see this as a reflection of how parents can inadvertently mess up their children. And here we have Pink's mother saying, don't worry, honey, I'm going to make sure everything you're fearing comes true. <laughs> Basically, what she is saying is that I will help you build that wall. Ooh, babe, I find the second section very fascinating because here we have Pink asking about love, loss, and heartbreak with the mom replying that she will check out all his girlfriends for him and she won't let anybody hurt him. She's basically saying, I'm going to be a helicopter parent. Mama's gonna check out all your girlfriends for you. What's interesting is the juxtaposition between the two mother replies. In the first section, it's almost like the mom is using fear to keep Pink by her side and to not let him leave the nest. But then in the second section, she's building upon that fear by saying, you have nothing to fear as long as you're by my side. Just stay under my wing. I won't let anybody hurt you. So I see this as a mom using Pink as a substitute for the loss of her husband. It's incredibly messed up, overbearing, and controlling. And again, we hear the brilliant specific use of two singers with Roger singing Pink's thoughts and David singing the mother's replies. Some cheerful songbirds open up side two with Goodbye Blue Sky. Then we hear some very lush acoustic guitars with some lovely what sounds like synth strings. I like this because it has a sweet sound but with an undertone of foreboding. Yeah, And the harmonized vocals here are just exquisite. Goodbye, blue sky. Goodbye, blue sky. Goodbye, 
This to me represents healing or trying to heal after the devastation of World War II because London was hit especially hard during the German Blitz. What's interesting is that, like Pink, Waters was born after the bombing and therefore doesn't have the same fear response that his mother has. It reinforces the idea of the song Mother where she really knows best and Pink has no idea of the dangers of the world. She's part of a generation that learned to fear the sound of airplanes. Up next, we have track two, Empty Spaces. This is largely an instrumental song with some spoken word and very few lyrics. It's more of a thought piece, a passing sequence. To me, I see it as representing the time jump in the story of Pink. At this point in the record, Pink is now a touring musician and his marriage is starting to fall apart. What shall we do to feel What's really cool is that there's this hidden message located on the left channel when you play the song backwards. Now, originally the song What Shall We Do Now would come after Empty Spaces. In fact, some pressings have the lyrics printed on the inner sleeves because it was such a last minute change. The reason it was removed was because the wall was too long and they needed it to fit on two records. However, the song was performed during the tour and was eventually used in the film version of The Wall. Moving on, we have the hard rocking Young Lust. Though it wasn't widely released as a single, it went on to be a staple of classic rock radio, which is how I first came to love of this song. At the time, I thought it was more about young love and sexual exploration, but now I know this is about Pink as a rock star sleeping with groupies. Again, we have that driving disco beat that works so well. What I especially love is the inflection of David's vocals. Normally it has a kind of a sweetness in his voice, but here they are guttural and feisty. Same with his guitar. Both really capitalize on the sexual energy of this song. Towards the end of the track, we hear an incoming phone call, and if it sounds like an authentic, real-world recording, well, you'd be right. While in Los Angeles, recording engineer James Guthrie made several phone calls to his friend in London. James was acting like a husband trying to get a hold of his wife, a Mrs. Pink Floyd, and he used a long-distance telephone operator to make the call. When his friend picked up the phone, answered in a male voice, and then quickly hung up, Roger and James were trying to capture the operator's real reaction of witnessing the wife cheat. Apparently, the first operator they tried didn't make a big deal about the situation, and it was only the second or third operator they tried that ended up on the tape. In the story, Pink is trying to phone his wife while on tour in the U.S., and it's at this point he realizes that their marriage is over. She's cheating on him while he sleeps with groupies. This call leads us right into track four, One of My Turns. The song opens with some one-sided dialogue. It sounds like a groupie coming to stay with Pink and you only hear her comments and reactions. You don't hear anything from Pink, which reinforces the numbness he must be experiencing realizing that his marriage is over. And when the vocals come in, there's a melancholy that works really well. This section really describes Pink's feeling towards his estranged wife. We pretend it's all right, but I have grown. You have grown colder. This then breaks away to a much more raucous section, and this feels like a breakdown of Pink. Plot-wise, he's physically destroying his hotel room, but I see this as him trying to shake things up in his life and express his anger, frustration, and numbness. He is going through a phase, but his outburst drives the groupie away, leaving him all alone. <laughs> This brings us to a very dark part of the record. Track five, Don't Leave Me Now. Oh, 
this feels terribly lonely and you can just faintly hear this breathing element. I can't tell if that's actually breathing or if it's some sort of percussive instrument being played. Regardless, its use here is incredibly effective in underscoring the loneliness of Pink. I feel his feelings. This is Pink mourning his marriage, fruitlessly pleading with her to make it work. Don't say What's so undercutting though is how Pink is begging his wife to not leave him, but he's only doing it so that he can then turn around and dump her in front of his friends. It's an incredibly selfish act, but it really illustrates Pink's immaturity at this point. He's careening towards rock bottom and I appreciate the honesty in the lyrics. Waters doesn't hold back and it's very cutting. I find it interesting that is played in Walt's time. It feels a little uneven, like there's some shifting weight, almost like Pink is a little drunk and angry with his life. In the end, this song excels at putting us in his head at this very moment. TV sounds signal the final reprise of another brick in the wall. This is Pink building his wall larger and closing himself off from those around him. What's different this time is that it sounds a little bit more passive aggressive than in previous versions, especially the final lyric. This to me gets to the core of what I think Roger is trying to say in The Wall. Just the idea of how we can get so angry with the world and then turn inward, shutting everything out. Fooling ourselves into believing we don't need anything or anyone, but how effective this is for Pink has yet to be seen as we close outside too with Goodbye Cruel World. I gotta be honest, this song feels a bit suicidal, but what I especially love is the mic presence. His voice sounds weak, defeated in a way that really helps to emphasize the sadness of Pink completing his wall. And the way the final line is sung without any music really drives that point home. There's nothing you can say to make me change my mind. Goodbye. Hey You opens side three with some soft guitar arpeggios and this lovely fretless bass, both played by David Gilmour. There's something about the guitar that makes it sound like there's some sort of wow and flutter effect being applied to it. It gives it such a fragile feel. And when Richard comes in on the Fender Rhodes, the piece takes on a fluid, floaty vibe. To me, it feels like being suspended in a pitch black void. Again, we have another brilliant vocal trade off of Gilmore and Waters. This time, I interpret this as Gilmore singing the voice of Pink's consciousness or guiding voice, and Waters is obviously singing the voice of Pink. The two voices are separated by the wall and both are trying to reach for the other, but they can't break through. When we hit the bridge, we are greeted by a return of another brick in the wall chorus melody played aggressively on electric guitar. This is so good because it represents the resistance of the wall. It's like the internal struggle of Pink trying to come out from behind his wall, but ultimately he can't break free because the wall is too high as Roger literally sings. The following instrumental section is one of my favorites as it really showcases the fretless bass. The way Gilmore plays the solo, it's like the bass is crying out for help or in agony. There's a helplessness that is so clear. When Roger sings the final verse, I see it as Pink trying to call out for help from behind the wall. He is alone and only now realizing he needs others to help him. And the way the final line fades out on an echo is so poignant because it works on many levels, including the physical plane of needing friends and loved ones to stand together, but also in the sense that if you lose your mind, e.g. the voice of Gilmore, you will fall. The sound of a TV and passing cars is the start of track two, Is There Anybody Out There? 
At this point, Pink is lost behind his wall, maybe zoning out, watching the TV in a cheap motel. While there's barely any music here, the distorted synth, electronic siren, and unsettling buzzing all combine to create a haunting first half of this song. Our only lyric is the title of the track repeated four times, with the final one having a sort of choir hit. I see this as the many voices in his head coming together to ask the question. The second half of the song is a beautiful instrumental section with strings and an acoustic guitar. The constant drawing of the bow creates such a fabulous quilt for the guitar to rest upon. I love this part because there's a moment when it gives us a glimmer of hope in the chord changes, like a happy memory for Pink. As this section gently resolves, we return to the realities of Pink being all alone. The TV is louder, the cars pass by, and we hear a neighbor yelling from another room. This is the start of track three, Nobody Home. The subtle delayed echo during the first verse is so good. I love how well it plays into the rhythm and the piano. It just adds this nice bit of texture. I've got a little black book with my poems in. Got a bag. And a the orchestral arrangement by Michael Kamen is superb theatrical production. It's not over the top, but it strikes just the right amount of balance to support the lyrics. I especially love how the horn rundown really reminds me of a superhero theme, and it helps to tie in with the lyric, Amazing Powers of Observation. Got amazing powers of observation. And the way they tie in the TV dialogue to go between his lyrics of calling his ex-wife, it's so good. That TV line is near perfect for expressing his thoughts. Well, I pick up the phone. There's still nobody home. The second verse is very much in reference to Sid Barrett, but as a whole, Roger has stated that this song is about the feelings that all rock stars experience while on the road. But I think he's touching on a universal feeling of being homesick, and that's what makes this song work so well for me. Though Roger doesn't go this far in the lyrics, I see the overall theme of this song as a statement on materialism and how it's ultimately unfulfilling. You can have all this wealth, but in the end, it's an empty vessel, and the thing that Pink really wants, he can't have. It's not there. As we transition into track four, we hear more of the TV, but this time it's a depiction of World War II. The actual song Vera doesn't come in until 20 seconds later, and it feels very much like a continuation of the last song. Now, this is on the shorter side, but that doesn't mean it's without merit. It's actually quite lovely, especially the way the strings dance with Roger's vocals. They just add this lush melancholy to the whole song that elevates it to a poetic level. What The sound of snare drums signal our next song, Bring the Boys Back Home. This sounds very patriotic, and on the surface, it can be seen as an anti-war statement, but in interviews, Roger has stated that it's more universal than that, that it's about not letting superficial things become more important than family and loved ones. I know it's depicted differently in the film, but I like to imagine that at this point, Pink has passed out in front of the TV and he's dreaming about World War II, and somehow it transforms him into a great leader calling for the end of the war, only to be woken up by his manager knocking on the door. The space between the last song and when the drums hit for Comfortably Numb just gives me chills every freaking time I hear it. I mean, what can I say? Comfortably Numb, it's one of Pink Floyd's best, but why I love it 
is because it has this spaced out psychedelic sound that is reminiscent of their earlier work. And again, we have the lead vocal trade-off between Waters and Gilmore, but this time Rogers sings the verses and he does so in a wonderful, poetic, flowing way. Though it's not as apparent in the first verse, by the second verse, there's no question that this is about drug use, but not necessarily abuse. It's more about using drugs to cope with pain, or rather not to feel at all, but to be comfortably numb. I love how the song switches gears for the chorus section. The strings come in and it feels very uplifting, almost like you're sailing on the ocean with the sun and the sea breeze hitting your face. Gilmore sings this section and he gives it such a light touch in contrast to Waters sometimes gruff delivery. Following soon after is the first of two guitar solos by Gilmore, and this one, like his vocals, is light and airy, floating on the same chord progression as the chorus. The next verse is really where we get the idea of this song being about drug use. The lyrics describe the act, but the music expresses the rush of it all. Just the sort of blissfulness of being high. All your problems drift away. And then we have that epic second guitar solo, and it's amazing. Probably David Gilmour's best work on the album. I really can't do it justice. You have to hear it for yourself to really understand what I'm talking about. I mean, it's perfect. It's exactly what I want to hear from this song. Overall, it's just beautiful, expressive playing that slowly recedes into silence, closing side three, which just might be my favorite side of the record. It works so well, but we still have one more side to go, and the show must go on. Overall, this is an interesting little song. Lyrically, it deals a bit with regret. On the one level, it's about Pink questioning his profession as a rock star and whether he still enjoys it. But on another level, it works as Pink questioning his life and perhaps contemplating suicide, especially with the lyrics, Pa, take me home, and Ma, let me go. In the end, Pink knows the show must go on, he must go on, and therefore we move on to track two, a reprise of In the Flesh, and here we have such a great thunderous opening with biting guitars, stabbing drums, and the overwhelming Hammond organ. And it's at this point we learn that Pink, as we knew him, has checked out, and what we're left with is this guy who let his power over the audience get the better of him. He's now insulting the crowd and flinging insults. In the film, this is depicted brilliantly by showing Pink as a fascist dictator. I love the inclusion of the crowd sound effect to really drive home the idea that we, the listener, are at Pink's live show, and it bleeds right into Run Like Hell. By itself, this is a great single with some fantastic energy, and it's got this marching disco beat that feels like Pink is being chased, and yet on top of it, the guitar feels very positive. Story-wise, Run Like Hell is a continuation of Pink's concert, still in his drug-fueled numbness. The lyrics are rather threatening, and in the film, they accompany scenes of Pink's minions wreaking havoc all over town. A little more than halfway through, we are treated to Richard's only keyboard solo on the whole record. It's one of my favorite parts, and it leads into a kind of an instrumental breakdown with some incoherent sound.
some crowd cheering signals our transition into track four, waiting for the worms, and it's at this point we get a glimpse of the old pink, isolated behind his wall. But it doesn't take long for his fascist persona to return, this time marching down the streets of London, leaving destruction in his wake. My favorite part is the improvised megaphone monologue that Roger performs through most of this song. Overall, this song feels like a death march, which was probably on purpose since the song is titled Waiting for the Worms, the real pink is just wasting away behind his wall, waiting to die. And it's brilliant the way it builds tension to the climax with the steady chanting of the crowd getting louder and louder before there's an immediate stop. And that's when we get into our next song, track five, Stop. This is Pink realizing that this is not the direction he wants to go. And maybe, just maybe, he's understanding that it's been his fault the whole time. His suffering was at his own hands. The song only lasts about 30 seconds before we move on to track six, The Trial. And this, out of all the songs in the album, feels the most operatic, the most musical, and oddly enough, the most contemporary, especially the way Roger sings. Overall, it has a kind of a carnival feel about it, which could be easily from the time signature or the types of horns being played. But it's not a happy carnival. It's more of a nightmare, a devil's circus. In some ways, it reminds me a bit of the trial in the Walt Disney version of Alice in Wonderland. Anyway, I'm kind of getting off topic here, but this song is brilliant in how theatrical it is. Pink is putting himself on trial. He is facing his demons, his past mistakes. We hear appearances from the mother, the demanding school teacher, and even his wife. All the while, Pink is questioning his sanity, and that's when we get this brilliant circus choir. And when the judge comes in, I love the use of crunchy guitar and distorted vocals, but more so, I love how there's a moment when we hear the return of the melody of Another Brick in the Wall. That really underscores the judge's ruling. The song ends with the crowd chanting, tear down the wall, followed by some loud crashing sound effects. Out of the rubble, we hear the final song on the album, the aptly titled Outside of the Wall. Musically, we are treated to a sparse arrangement of acoustic instruments that gives it a somber yet peaceful feeling. Roger's sing-talking is really effective here, almost like he's reading a eulogy for Pink. And the best part is the children's choir singing the same lyrics he is reading. It's just beautiful music that really helps to conclude the album. And in this destruction, what we learn is that what he really needed was always just outside of his wall. By closing himself off, he didn't allow love to come in. I like to look at this song as a moment of clarity for Pink, almost a rebirth, if you will, which is interesting because the way Roger chose to end the song abruptly. You briefly hear him say, isn't this where, before the album cuts off. It only makes sense when you go back to side one and realize the album begins with him saying, we came in. He essentially created an endless album. Pink is reborn, doomed to repeat himself. But in all seriousness, what a brilliant way to close a fantastic record. It's impossible to deny the impact of this album. It's incredibly well known and it tells a complete story that is not only poignant, 
but has universal appeal. It perfectly captures the late 70s zeitgeist, a generation that grew up during World War II and were coming to terms with the world and what it all means. But more specifically, I think it's also Roger Waters hitting a midlife crisis, and in that sense, this record is fantastic. It's a masterwork, a magnum opus. That being said, as an album, it's one that requires an active listener. It's heavy, it's dark, thought-provoking, challenging, and it's not something you can just listen to lightly or pass the time with. It's an experience, a wonderful experience, but one you have to pay attention to. This is a classic. It is something that should be experienced as a whole, and so I highly recommend picking this up. At the very least, you gotta hear it once. Well, everybody, that will do it for my review of Pink Floyd's The Wall. I want to thank you all so much for watching. I am your Vinyl Geek, and I'll catch you on the flip side. Hey everyone, thanks again for watching my review of Pink Floyd's The Wall. Be sure to check out my paired cocktail that I call Goodbye Blue Sky. It's a refreshing gin-based drink that changes color right before your eyes. You're not going to want to miss it.